Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I would like to welcome you to the fifth lecture in the summer 2020 offering of EC3084, Signals and Systems. Today we're going to talk about scaling and shifting functions. Now, shifting functions is something we've done a lot of already, and we've also seen a lot of in EC2026. So this will be primarily a review. Let's make a function to shift. Let's say it starts at 2, and this function is going to ramp up from 0 to a value of 1 at 4, and then it stays at 1 for a couple of more time units and then drops back down. So let's call this function x of t. Suppose I want to shift it to the right, in which case I'll write y1 of t is equal to x of, let's say I want to just shift it one time unit to the right. So I'll write t minus 1. This forms a delay operation. So I'll put down a new axis to indicate this delay. Here we'll have it start at 3, and it will go up to 7, like thus. So nothing particularly fancy there. Now suppose I want to shift the signal to the left. Here I might say, let's define a y2, which would equal to x of t. I don't have to have this be an integer anymore because we're not in a discrete time context. So I might just shift it to the left by a half. So I'll put down my same set of tick marks again. I apparently am incapable of free drawing evenly spaced tick marks, let alone a horizontal line. All right, so don't get confused. We're not looking here, we're looking up here. We want to move this halfway to the left, so it's going to start at one and a half, then it's going to rise until we get to three and a half, and then it's going to stay stationary up till five and a half. So it goes, zoop, comes up to one here, stays here for a bit, and then comes back down. So nothing new, strange happening there. We've been shifting functions throughout the various lectures in EC3084, and you will have seen a ton of this in 2026 in the discrete time context. Now let's talk about scaling functions. Here we're a little freer than we are in the discrete time context because in that sort of context you have to be scaling by integer numbers and figuring out what you're doing if you're dropping samples or repeating samples, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But here you can just do whatever. Let me copy my original function. I'll copy it. Aha! Uh -huh. I think I created a new layer. That's new and exciting. Yeah. Haven't done that before. Let us create a new function here. Let's call it y of 3. And let's say it's this x function. But now instead of addressing it as t, we're going to address it as 2t. So this, in essence, speeds up the rate at which we're clocking through the function here. So this has a contraction effect. It's going to shrink the function. Instead of starting at 2, this is going to go from 1 to 2. And then what's going from 4 to 6 originally is now going to go from 2 to 3. So this compressed quite a bit. I'm basically running through the function twice as fast. All right, let's instead divide by 2. So we're going to take t and divide it by 2 in here. Now this is going to have the effect of stretching out the function. Oh, and now we're really going to test my ability to draw an axis, because this is going to need to go all the way up to 12. I can't even draw a horizontal line. One, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Okay, so we'll put zero over here. Do, do, do. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. All right, in order to get to a certain point in the function x, we have to travel twice as far in time to compensate for this divide by 2. This is going to start at 4. It's going to slowly rise up till 8, and then it's going to hold stationary until 12. So it's going to go, come up here to 1. It's going to hold here for 4, and then it's going to drop back down at 12. Okay, so that's all well and good. That's how we can do scaling. And again, now that we're in the continuous time context, 
I don't have to have this or this be an integer. I can be scaling by whatever. So another operation that will show up is mirroring. So here we're just, <laughs> I can't spell mirror. Mirror in. Okay, so this isn't terribly fancy. We'll just take our function and put a minus sign here. Write another axis here. Let's see if I can make it evenly spaced going left instead of going right. And no, my axes are just as sloppy as going left as they are going right. I'll start at minus two here. It climbs up going this direction and then stays here and then drops down like that. Ooh, this is all spooky wavy. Okay, so that's not terribly exciting. And you can combine mirroring and scaling without a whole lot of difficulty. Combining mirroring with shifting can get confusing. I'll show you how to handle that cleanly in a second. So here we might say, what if we've got minus 2t? Okay, well, I can think about this a couple of ways. And basically it comes from the fact that I can think of this as minus 2t like this, or I can equivalently think about it like this. So I can think about it as mirroring first and then scaling, or I can think of it as scaling first and then mirroring because this multiplication distributes through. So either way, I wind up with this flipped version compressed. So this is going to go from 0 at minus 1 up to 1 at minus 2, and then it's going to stay 1 up until 3. So this has been flipped and also compressed. I'm not going to bother writing down the other version where we're expanding it. You get the idea. Okay, so that's all well and good. What gets difficult is if you try shifting and scaling, and I'm going to include that mirroring operation and scaling, where we could imagine we just have a minus sign with that constant that's sitting in front. The trouble is, if you're doing both of these at the same time, it can get terribly confusing. So if somebody comes up to you on the street and asks if you can plot a function like this, you should first look at them very suspiciously, because it would be very strange of them to make such a request. Let's say we had something like this. I've got minus 2t plus 6. So if you try to deal with it in this form, you'll find yourself becoming extremely confused. The best thing to do is to take this constant that's sitting in front of the t and factor it out so you only get the t by itself. So what we'll do is we'll write this as x minus 2 times t. Okay, so what do we need to put here in order to get the 6? We would need to put a minus 3 because now I can think about this in two stages. I can think about it first as scaling and mirroring the original function and then I can think about it as shifting the function. So first I'm going to mirror and scale the function. Let's see, this was 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So if I flip that function around and scale it, so it'll go from minus 1 to minus 2 to minus 3, like thus. It's going to go up like here, then it's going to stay here. That incorporates the mirroring and the scaling. And then I'll take this function that I've already mirrored in this case because there's a minus sign and scaled, and I'm going to shift it here to the right by 3. If this was a plus, I'll be shifting to the left. But here I'm going to shift it to the right by 3. Oh, and I didn't particularly plan this per se, but it looks like it's now going to start at 0 if I shift this 3 unit time units to the right. So I'll be 0, 1, and then I guess it'll be 2 here, right? Because this minus 1, if it shifted 3 units to the right, lands at 2. So don't try to think about it in this form. You'll just get confused. Always make this transformation first. So you can then scale, mirror if you need to, and then do the shifting. And when you do this, be sure to put the T as the first term here. Make sure there's nothing sitting in front of it, or else, again, you're going to get confused. All right, so if you are one of my students taking this class in the summer 2020 semester, I would like you to do the following. There is a quiz on Canvas 
So there's a Canvas quiz. And I would like you to go to that quiz, and I would like you to tell me what other classes you're taking. In particular, I would like to know how they're handling the distance learning. So things like, how are they handling exams? If they are doing exams, any projects? How are they handling turning in homework to the extent there are such things, etc.? And in particular, how are they handling content delivery? Are they doing things in real time? Are they holding classes on blue jeans or something and you have to show up to the class or maybe they record it to look at later? Are they doing things asynchronously the way I am, pre-recording things and editing them and trying to put up something a little more polished? How are they handling things like office hours? Because I think there's some professors out there having office hours with blue jeans, and I haven't figured out how to do stuff like that yet, but I should soon. Or are they doing things like uh, online chat, you know, text chat, beyond just helping people with email? Anyway, I want to get a sense what your other instructors are doing and how they're handling things. And if you are in my class, please answer these questions by Wednesday. Wednesday the 20th, let's say by, I don't know, something like 5 o'clock p.m. I want to get a sense of what you're up against, <laughs> given the number of other classes you are taking this semester. And I also want to get a sense of what other instructors are doing, and maybe I can leverage if they're using a certain tool that you're familiar with, I can also use the same tool and avoid you having to learn some new tools.